You're on episode 18 of the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast and we're here in Limerick in the Castle Troy Hotel in lovely surroundings. I'm down here watching the Kennedy Cup and I'm here with Limerick midfielder Owen Weiren. Owen, how are you? Yeah, not too bad, Jay. How are you? Doing? Good, thanks. Uh, myself and Owen chatting here early on Tuesday morning before he goes training. Uh, loads of things to discuss, Owen. Uh, firstly, we do have to say that the Limerick players have been paid. There was the stories last week before their game against Bowes that wages were late. They've been paid in full and the club as well as the PFI have asked us not to discuss this uh, with any of the players, which we're not going to do, but they have been paid and they're all getting ready to play Shamrock Rovers this coming Friday in the last game before the summer break. Owen, the most recent game uh, was in Dundalk on Friday, a uh, 4-0 defeat. Dundalk, I think that's seven wins in a row for them. Not the best... Uh, form to be facing them in what was the game like? Yeah, obviously when you go and play the dark away it's it's always gonna be a difficult game and, and we were missing one or two bodies in, in key areas of the pitch for us. So it was always gonna be a hard game. Um I thought for sixty five minutes we were well in the game. Yeah, we we gave Dundalk a, a good run for the money for sixty five minutes but as soon as they scored that second goal, uh you all know how difficult it is then. They've got so many good players and uh, kept the ball well, you know. It was it was difficult towards the end, but I think there was a lot of positives to take from it. What's a place like Oriel Park like to play in against Dundalk when they're two up, three up, four up in a game when you know once they've got the second, you've probably not got much hope of getting anything from it. Yeah, look, uh, so I suppose as soon as the the penalty was given away, uh, my first instinct was to look up at the clock and you see 65 minutes and. You're thinking, is it, most games you're you're two 0 down, and you're thinking, right, can we get back in the game? Can we get one quickly and get back in the game? But you know, naturally in the back of your head, once Dundalk score score two or three goals, um, they're probably the one side in the league that I'd say that are capable of going on and scoring a couple more. Yeah, it brings things on now to Shamrock Rovers on Friday, the last game before the break. I think you're seven points ahead of Bray, a couple uh, behind Sligo and Bohemians as well. So if you can pick up points just heading into the break before a holiday, so it will give everybody a big boost, especially given what's gone on the last couple of weeks. But from a football point of view, three points is 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 a, is a must really. Yeah, and and to be honest, we feel um, we feel it's a very winnable game for us. The the two games we played previously against Rovers were beaten one 0 at home, um, and only got beaten by a penalty. And, uh, and obviously drew 1-1 in Tala only a few weeks ago and put in a really good performance so we'll go into Friday thinking that especially if we can replicate our last home performance against Bowes that we can go and get three points Given the way the league is at the moment with yourselves and Sligo and Bowes quite close together even though you haven't won too many matches there still has to be a belief I'm sure that you can pick up enough points to at least finish above one of those teams so eight would, would yeah. be I'm sure the minimum aim Yeah look I think the big thing for us is and anybody will see it, if we've got our best 11 players on paper, um, we're a good side, we've got good players, there's a lot of experience in the side, um, we've just been very, very unlucky with injuries and I know you don't want to make excuses and stuff, but it is very, very difficult because there's no easy games in this league and if you're short two or three key players, it does make it all the more difficult, but we know in particular, I think in recent weeks, um, bar Friday, we've been a lot better defensively. Um, which has been important for us and I think at this stage it's just about taking our chances and, and putting the ball in the back of the net a little bit more. I'm sure you'd be interested to try and see which Shamrock Rovers you'll face because they've been very up and down in the last 12 or 14 yeah. games. I've watched their three most recent wins. Um, they hammered St. Pat's at home, they hammered Cork at home and did a really good win recently obviously as well in, in their last outing um, against Bray. So they've been quite good in some games and not so good in others so you'll be interested and you'll be hopeful you're facing the out of sorts Rovers instead of the inform. but if they're informed, they're a very good team as well. Yeah, look, again with Rovers, we know where if they click, they're they're a very good side and, and they're littered with, with excellent players. But I think, again, it's key for us that we're the home side. We need to go and take the initiative to, and take the game to them and, and believe that we've got very good players on our side, which which I believe we do and, and, and we know in-house that we do. You know, but it's just a case, I think, that we need to show that a little bit more on a consistent basis. Probably Rovers are probably saying the same thing as well. Yeah, the market field has been an interesting place this year because of uh, the pitch hasn't been very good. I think I believe it's getting better, and also there was the statements from the club about you know some fans and the fans wanting to stay away and stuff. And the results haven't been good. We spoke to Tommy Barrett about a month ago, and he was saying that he did feel some of the fans were, were being a little bit unfair on some of the players. What's that atmosphere being like to play in the pitch not being good and and maybe the crowd dropping off and some of the fans being a bit vocal of their 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 uh, displeasure with certain players for whatever reason? Yeah, I think. Well, but we'd only heard this fact now. I think last week um, that I think we have the third or fourth best away record in the league. Um, but I think the either the worst or the second worst home record. You know, so I think that speaks volumes as well in terms of just as players. It's up to us to, to put in performances and get results and get the crowd behind us. Um, I will say that there's probably been a little bit of disappointment in terms of what's gone on and stuff in terms of the relationship with fans and and uh, and the club, and it has maybe had an effect on. 
you know, the atmosphere in the home games and stuff. But I think for us as players, we just need to block that out. And, you know, it's a game, 11 players against 11 players, and that's all that matters, really. Yeah, you've been at a couple of the other clubs now, a couple of spells at Bowles, Sligo and Limerick. How important for you is it that the home atmosphere is, is a good one? Because, as you mentioned, home records are you know, are hugely important. We look at the top teams in the league, Cork and the Dock, they pick up points every time they play at home, they pick up points and they have a great home support. And in your experience here and maybe also in the UK as well, just the importance of, of a good home atmosphere, which maybe you guys haven't had as much this year. Yeah, look, the, the last couple of years in particular at Bowes, the atmosphere in games and the support has been fantastic. And I think, I think it comes from a lot of work that the club have done off the pitch. And, you know, it's like for the likes of Dundalk and Cork if you're winning games and you're competing at the top end of the table and doing well that naturally brings people into the doors and you know but I think for, for other sides maybe they're a little bit further down the table they need to be a bit more creative I'd say um, in terms of trying to get people in the door because it, it, it does make an impact not just financially on the club but obviously it helps give the players a lift as well In terms of life overall in Limerick you know, off the pitch issues aside and results aside, how have you found being a Limerick player and living down here? I know you lived in Sligo as well. You, you were able to pop back to Dublin the odd time, but how do you find kind of living? Because it's something quite common down the league where players from Dublin, particularly, go and, and you know play for Cork or play for you know Dundalk or play for Limerick and live there. Yeah, well, I suppose before I come, came down, um, I'd lived with Danny Cairns previously um, during my time in England. We played together and lived together, so. I'm living with him now down here as well, so obviously that's helped uh, both of us, I suppose, settle into new surroundings and stuff. But to be honest, Limerick's a great city. Like I've, I haven't got a bad word to say about it, and you know I've enjoyed my time here so far. And hopefully, some more of the same. What age are you now? I'm 25. So, how does Owen Weiran, who's 25, reflect on his career to date with playing for St Kevin's in a really successful team, moving to the UK, and now being back and having had, a, as we said, a couple of spells at Bowles, Sligo, and now at Limerick? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things I'd probably tell my, my 14, 15 year old self I'm not saying that I do a lot of things differently you know because I, I think I went into it and I, I was focused on football I always have been a little bit of bad luck along the way um, but I definitely probably would have gone in with my eyes a little bit more open maybe a little bit naive in terms of what the game of football can throw up and you know what obstacles can come up and what you can face but you know it's been a journey and that's probably the best way of describing it yeah, I had Sam Verdon from Longford on last week. We were talking about education and yeah. he used the exact same phrase, if I was to be able to speak to an 18-year-old Sam Verdon, I'd yeah. tell him this. Yeah. And you said the same as a 14, 15-year-old embarking on a career in England which has taken you back here. Yeah. In hindsight, what would you have mentioned to that person when you were trying to make that choice of, of going to West Ham or staying here or, or you know, finishing yeah. school and that sort of stuff? Yeah, well, I, th- I think it's very difficult, I suppose, that uh, to tell a 15, 16, 17-year-old those things. Everybody's got their own... Um, their own individual circumstances and you know players are motivated by different things I suppose as well um, but even just what, what's gone on in recent weeks at our club and what seems to have gone on a few times since I've been in the league anyway um, with the financial issues I, I, I spoke to a couple of the younger members of our squad last week and just said if you, if you, if you haven't thought about starting you know some form of education now um, you better start thinking about it because before you know it, like I said, I'm 25 now, I'll be 26 at the end of the year. The years start creeping up. Um, I've just finished my third year of a business degree and you know uh, completed my UEFA B licence last year. So I'm lucky that I've, I have things in place now to you know focus my attention away from football. So I, th- I think that would be the advice I'd give a lad, whether he's 17 or 18 or 21, 22. Um, when you're a young player in this game, things can change very, very quickly, you know. So I think it's it's always good to have something else to focus on. Yeah, we'll speak about your coaching and your stuff in college in a minute. When you're 16 and you're making the choice to go to West Ham nine years ago, what's in your head then? Is it just the case of I've played football for so long? This is the dream that everybody has had, including me. I need to go and try it, or what other things are influencing your decision as a young teenager? Yeah, I I, I think. Uh, I think 10 years ago that there was less discussion about whether there was an option to stay at home you know I think over the last couple of years there's there's a debate now about whether players are better off staying and, and finishing the league and playing in the league and there's more and more players going over and getting the opportunity at a later age now than there probably ever has been you know so I think if that option was available to me 10 years ago things may have been different um, my family I suppose always put always pushed me um, you know academically to to try and be the best I could be and so that may have been more of a realistic discussion now if I was 16 than it was 10 years ago but you know when you're that age I, I think I knew from 
from 13, 14 that I was going to be going away at 15, 16, you know, I had a couple of offers on the table and stuff. And, and when you're that age and, you know, those things are thrown at you straight away and it's all you've ever wanted to do and all you've ever wanted to be, it's very hard to, to say no and turn it down. What sort of words would you use to describe life as a young footballer in England? Um, challenging. I, I, I think, again, it comes down to people... It's done with that be. Yeah. Yeah, people have different circumstances. You know, I I I didn't struggle from homesickness, which is one obviously issue that a lot of people have a problem with. Uh, my family used to come over quite regularly. I lived in a digs where there was 12, 13, 14 young lads rather than one or two when you're living with a family. So obviously those type of things um, make the transition a lot easier. You know, but, a, but obviously it's challenging from a football point of view. Uh, new managers coming in, new players coming in. Um, there's a, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of changes that go on in football clubs, which I think people from the outset don't realise. Yeah, even here this week at the Kennedy Cup, there's so many scouts and people from English clubs and people from Irish clubs and so on. Even now and in comparison to then, is there enough information you know, given to young players and their families as to what they're going to face when they're there and, and what options that, and you know what things they need to do to ensure that they stay there? Because the stats of, of people, and unfortunately at the minute you're one of them who, who go and come back, are quite high. Yeah, I think... Um, I think the most important people nearly to educate is the parents because I think um, because I, because I know from work, from working with young players at the moment how parents can get their hopes up and if their kids doing well at 13, 14 they think that's it he's he's not that he's made it you know but he but he's he's not far off and stuff and I, I think they're the ones that need to really really know the stats in terms of how many don't make the grade and how many don't come back because at the end of the day parents are going to have more of an influence on their kids and than any coaches or anybody else giving advice, you know, so I think it needs to start at home. If we just stick on the team of football for now or something related to football injuries, just, you know, speak to me a little bit about the injuries that you've had because you've, you know, for a player who's 25, you've had a couple of serious ones. Yeah, uh, but my first ACL happened um, before this. I'd never had a serious injury. I think the, the longest I'd ever been out was four weeks before that. And uh, last year in my contract, I just signed a year extension at West Ham in the, in the May. Um, had a good pre-season uh, was doing well was in uh, the Ireland under 21 plans and you know things had started well and I played in a reserve game against Arsenal and, and tore my ACL in the game and you know at that stage I'd, I'd never really given much consideration to what, to what an ACL was and you know what the recovery process was and you know it was uh, they were really difficult 9-10 months because when you're when you're living alone your own uh, you're 19 you're away from your family that was quite difficult and you know, I suppose you you, you don't uh, you don't ever plan for something like that happening. Um, obviously, last year I I done it in pre season, uh, the opposite knee now, and uh, but I went into a completely different mindset. You know, I knew exactly what what the recovery process entailed and and the rehab, and you know I was able to okay for a couple of days. I was disappointed, and you know, disappointed is probably an understatement now. Like, but. I was able to then get get my head around it and get focused and and get thinking about coming back stronger and you know it's been it's been mentally tough and, and mentally challenging on both occasions for different reasons but you know I think uh, it's made me stronger. Um, it, I'd like to think it's made me a better player. It probably makes me have to rely on my brain a little bit more than my legs at this stage. So you know it's a uh, but yeah I I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy. You know it's 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 a difficult injury to come back from but like I said it's it's a test of your character and I think I've passed uh, with flying colours both times Yeah some interesting scars as well on these knees under the table you're on episode 18 of the Off the Ball League of Ireland podcast it's Jamie Moore here in the Castleroy Hotel here in Limerick sitting here with uh, Limerick midfielder Owen Weir and Owen the injuries were definitely not a blessing in disguise but the second one particularly really kicked off your love for being a football coach um, just talk us through your coaching qualification so far and have you used a lot of the time when you were injured maybe to focus a little bit on coaching and I know when you were at Bowes last season you did some opposition scouting and you're now working at St Kevin's and hopefully to do your A licence as well that the time away when you couldn't play football you were learning to coach it yeah um, I, I think even going back to the, the 17 and 18 when I was coming home in the summer I was, I was being asked to put on little bits of sessions here and, and and that, and you can see, I think, um, for anybody, a kid when they when they look at you and they, they see that you're a professional and, and that's what they want to aspire to be, and, and you can see how much they they take on and value the information you give them. Um, I think that's what really set me off was the fact that I could make a difference, you know, and people would listen to me. And 
I'd like to think I always had a, a good knowledge of the game. I was always interested in sort of the, the tactical side of the game and things like that. And it's just sort of flourished over the last couple of years. And you now I think I, I start my uh, my youth cert. I did, done the level one over in England and uh, came home and done my, my youth cert a couple of years ago. And as soon as I started that, and I, to be honest with you, I've got into Kevin's two and a half two and a half years ago now. And um, a great bunch of players now the under 12 Premier side so I went in when they were under 10s and uh, you know, I think that really kick started once, you, once you're doing it regularly you can, you can put on a session here and there and, and not really get a feel for it but whenever you start um, putting on three or four sessions a week uh, I, I think it, it starts to become more than just a, a hobby and an interest and it becomes a bit more of a passion and that's how it's escalated for me you know I'm enjoying it more and more as time goes on and you know constantly learning as well just because you're a player and you've played at a high level doesn't mean you know it all as a coach you know there's there's brilliant coaches throughout the club at St Kevin's and you know I was fortunate to see that as a player myself over the years when I was younger and um, you know I'm, I'm getting a good education from a coaching point of view at the club. What do you enjoy most about being a coach of young players and yeah. particularly young players who are very good who are at a level where you know and there's no crap or no shit they don't want anything but to have the ball and to train and at times I know younger players the parents can be a distraction and can be a problem in many yeah. cases but in terms of actually being on the coach pitch with them and then seeing them maybe do stuff that you've helped them with yeah. in the, on the on the match day I think it's uh, the innocence of it really you know is, is, is not really knowing what's ahead of them and, and the excitement I think at that stage of your career that you know the sky is the limit and we try to teach our lads that you know you're at, you're at an age now where if you want to develop and you want to improve you can really push on and and, and make a good living for yourself in the game but you know you don't want to talk to 11 12 year olds like that at this stage I'd be very much in the frame of mind as a coach that I want them to enjoy every session I want them to express themselves on the pitch you know I, I nearly want them to treat it as, as they would as if they're playing up in the park with their mates obviously there needs to be a discipline element and you know you're, you're, you're teaching them other sides of the game and even at that age you know little things about professionalism and bits and pieces like that but you know, as long as the kids are enjoying it and they've got a smile on their faces, then then I always will. Yeah, and when you're a League of Ireland player, you know, there's plenty of times where you've got a long trip, where you've had a hard week, or your results haven't gone well, and you're probably going, oh, football. But then when you go and coach the young boys, it yeah. probably gives you a little bit of a love and a little bit of a buzz for it again. And I think one of the good things about being a football coach is if something hasn't gone well for you as a player on a Friday night and your little team are playing on a Saturday, immediately your brain has gone, oh, well, that's done now. I need to just, I need to get on with, with coaching, which is a big help. Yeah, I, I think the difficult thing I've found is that like uh, we've just recently won the All-Ireland on the 12s with, with Mike Kevin's side and so we're used to winning most weeks and obviously we've been going through a rough patch at Limerick at times this year so I'm, I'm coming from losing on a Friday to my lad slagging me on a Saturday morning when I come in asking me what's happened and you know little funny things like that will, will often cheer up your mood and you know they're, they're a great bunch of lads and, and great kids and they're a pleasure to work with. Well, then Limerick better start winning some matches and then the boys will, won't be giving any more uh, any more slagging there. Yeah. Oh, and finally, the education side of things is a team we spoke about last week. We're still in leaving Sir time as well. Yeah. Talk to us about how you went to England as a 16-year-old, what education was available there and how you ended up in the middle of a degree here at the age of 25 and kind of having to go back to education, having left it early. Yeah, um, so what happened to me was I, 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 I left school with a good junior cert behind me, um, which gave me a little bit of a confidence to actually push on and attempt to do my leaving cert long distance which I did I took a year gap um, as if it was a, a transition year I suppose and um, with the Kilroy College I attempted to take on five leaving cert subjects along with uh, the BTEC sports science course that you that every scholar has to do over there in England and uh, I'd done a year of it and it was it was very very difficult it really was at, at 16 17 to try and teach yourself more or less it, it was very hard and it, it was something that I, I couldn't do and it was actually something I gave up and thought you know what if I can't if I can't do it right there's no point in doing it now and I can always go back and do it if I needed to and uh, I suppose whenever I done my first ACL that was you know you're 19 and then that's a scary part because you know it's a career threatening injury and I actually went there and done a sports management degree um, with a the Johan Cruyff Institute in Barcelona which was more or less it was a year long course which would allow me then to go in and do an honours degree after so because obviously without leaving so I had to qualify somehow and um, so I'm glad I got that under my belt it gave me something to focus on obviously during the first injury and then uh, 
it gave me obviously the option of distance learning and, and it gave me the confidence to realise that you know what I can apply myself apply myself to or I, I do have the self discipline to teach myself and you know to study and come home from training and, and, and put the effort in and the work in and, and that got me into the, the business degree I'm doing now at the Open University in the UK and three years into that really enjoying it um, I'm doing it part time as well so it means there's not too much pressure you know I can play full time football like I can do the degree part time and I can coach obviously in the evening so I have a nice balance at the moment going on a busy man but a nice balance all the time Yeah I hope the people watching and listening feel the same but you're an interesting guy in the story of all of that injuries coaching playing yeah. education it's it's an interesting kind of path you've taken isn't it um again i i think any young lad nearly needs a little bit of a, a push i know i did um i'm blessed with the family background i have behind me uh my two parents have always pushed me to you know be more than just a footballer don't let people sort of confine you to that and think of you just as that you've got far more to offer as a person and a character than just that and you know, I think that's what always allowed me to come out my shell and be myself. You know, I can yes, there's there's own footballer and stuff like that, but I like to think I've I've other things to offer the world and you know, I, I suppose it stems from that, you know, it's a confidence thing I think with a lot of players are maybe football is all they know and they're a little bit afraid to put themselves out and, and try something new and you know, my advice on that is until you do it you won't know and, and you'll learn a lot more about yourself during the process when you do and you know, you'll be better for it in the end. Wow, we're very deep stuff there from Owen Wearing. Now, every time Owen Wearing comes to this podcast, I always slag him about something. Um, and I was wondering when we were coming to meet here what he might be wearing. And he's going to training, so he's into training gear. Um, you like to bring lots of things to the world, as you said. One of them is your dress sense. Um, you've got a, a hairband hiding under there, which you're not wearing, thankfully. Uh, talk us through the dress sense, the hair, the, the Owen Wearing style icon because did I read somewhere at one stage you were thinking of becoming a fashion designer or were you interested in something like that or you've big, a big interest in clothes anyway yeah um, one of your f- uh, friends uh, Danny Rogers goalkeeper yeah. plays for Aberdeen as well yeah, quite similar everything about me yeah so um, no it, it's uh, I suppose from a fashion point of view it's something I've, I've always had since I was a kid you know I, I've uh, I've experimented with nearly every hairstyle you can imagine I think at this stage and you know from a, from a clothing point of view I, I just say I, I try and wear what suits me and I'd encourage anybody else to do the same <laughs> I don't think it suits him yeah. but he does Owen Wearing thanks a million yeah, no problem yeah that's Owen Wearing there Limerick's Owen Wearing here in the Castroy Hotel in episode 18 of the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast it's time for us now to move on and I'm going to very quickly move from here to somewhere up the road here and uh, be joined by former Sligo player now FII uh, full time RDO John Russell